four o'clock, so we'll get started um, because some of us here are more pressed for time than others because they're in at an airport waiting for a flight. And so um, I should introduce, yeah, today's meeting is on um, crimmigration, and we'll get into exactly what that means here in a minute. But we've also changed, we normally kind of do a, a an appetizer before the entree, before the main course, um, but we're going to reverse that today um, because Diane, who's joining us from the, from the airport in Utah, um, as I say, she, she's pressed for time and she's going to introduce um, the great panel of speakers that we have. And so um, can I get, first off, I guess, can I get a motion to approve the agenda? I'll move to approve the agenda. That's great. And do I have a second? Second. That's great. Thanks, Les. And then um, is there any further discussion, objections, anything people want to change or add or... No, okay, then we'll go for a vote just by asking, is there anybody um, opposed? And hearing nobody opposed, the motion is uh, passed unanimously. And with that, I'd like to then hand over to uh, Diane. Um, today's talk is gonna be very interesting. It is on the subject of crimmigration, which is the, the juxtaposition of criminal law and immigration law um, in this country. And we have three speakers today. Um, our Point Loma uh, resident, Jerry Wasson, who's been working as a federal defense attorney for uh, approximately 30 years, uh, will join us, as well as Andrew Nietor, who's the chair of the local Immigration Lawyers Association. And our third speaker is Odd Ruffing, who is uh, an immigrant um, as well as a lawyer uh, defending immigrants' rights. So at this point, I will hand it over to Jerry um, to uh, give us a short presentation. Thank you, Diane. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm glad to be here today. Uh, well, uh, what I wanted to speak about was uh, what exactly crimmigration is. And as Diane said, it's the where criminal law meets immigration law. And basically what that means is uh, the prosecution of unauthorized entry into the United States. And uh, that uh, why this is an important topic, I think, is because immigration related offenses uh, are, consist of um, the large amount of federal prosecution. Um, and uh, the Justice Department statistics showed in, in 2018, immigration related offenses uh, comprised of nearly 70% of all federal criminal prosecutions in the United States. And the, the vast majority of those prosecutions of immigration related prosecutions involve what are called illegal entry or illegal reentry cases. And that is when a person who is not a US citizen simply enters the United States without lawful permission to do so. Typically it means without the law, uh, lawful documents, immigration documents. Um, that's illegal entry. Uh, the other offense that is most commonly prosecuted is illegal re-entry. And that's typically the same offense, except it, it also involves a person uh, who has previously been deported. So they're not a US citizen, they don't have proper documents. They enter the United States after already having been deported once previously. Um, the difference between the two is that illegal entry is a misdemeanor offense and illegal reentry is a felony offense. The difference between a misdemeanor and a felony offense is a misdemeanor offense has a, a maximum sentence of um, in, in custody of one year or less. In a felony offense, the maximum sentence is greater than one year in custody. Um, those aren't the maximum sentences for those offenses. That, that's the definition of a misdemeanor versus a felony. Um, the, the maximum sentence for someone just simply coming into the country without proper documentation is six months in prison. Uh, for a illegal reentry case, it's either uh, two years, 10 years or 20 years in prison, depending on what their criminal history is. Uh, and 
so that's that's the different offenses that that uh, when we talk about unauthorized entry into the United States, there's other ways to commit that offense uh, through document fraud or making a false claim to U.S. citizen, saying you're you're a U.S. citizen at the at the port of entry when you're not. But those are not the typical cases that we see. Uh, the vast majority of these cases are these illegal entry or illegal reentry cases. Um, so who, who are we prosecuting here? Well, um, the statistics show from the U.S. Sentencing Commission that 99% uh, of these cases involve Hispanics. 97% uh, are male. Uh, their average age is 36. And this is going back to 2016 through 2020. Um, and the vast majority of them, well, not the vast, but the majority of them have no or very little criminal history. And what I mean by criminal history is any prior criminal convictions that they have. Um, in 2020, fiscal year 2020, 66% of the people that were prosecuted for either illegal entry or reentry had no or very little criminal history. Uh, and when I say little criminal history, what I'm talking about is typically traffic tickets or uh, driving on a suspended license, something of that nature. Um, in 2016, that number was 50%. Um, and the, the percentage of people who have what I would call serious criminal history is, is, a, lot, is a lot less. In 2020, of all the people that we prosecuted for these offenses, only 5% of them had a serious criminal history. And when I mean serious criminal history, what I'm talking about is, is more like uh, drug offenses in the past, uh, possession or, or possession for sales or burglary offenses, robbery offenses, something like that. Um, it's, it's a misconception that I hear from my friends all the time, like, oh, don't we only, prosecute the murders and, and rapists that come into the United States and don't we just let the other people go? It's like, no, that's not true at all. Um, it, it's really rare to see a, a person who's been convicted of a murder offense or a, a rape conviction um, to be a prosecutor for illegal reentry. We just don't see that. Um, in, in my 30 years of, of practice, I, I maybe only had a, a couple of those people of the hundreds and hundreds of these people that I've represented. Um, so the vast majority of them are, um, at least in 2020, it was 66% are um, at, at no criminal history or very little criminal history. Um, but surprisingly, um, their, sentences, they, they, their sentences are about the same throughout, uh, from 2016 to, to, to 2020, their average sentences are around eight to 14 months in that time frame. Um, and also their conviction rate is around 97%. So, which means of all the people who were charged with these offenses, 97% roughly were convicted. Uh, the, their average sentence that they received is around eight months. Um, it was 14 months in 2016, but it, it averaged in that, in, that, uh, in that time frame between those two numbers. Um, so in my experience, uh, the, the typical client that I get in these kind of cases are a, a mid 30 year old male, a Mexican male who is a construction worker uh, or a landscaper. Uh, the vast majority of my clients in these cases fit that profile. Um, and the, the females that I've represented, they're not many, but they tend to be um, house cleaners or hotel workers, nannies, people like this. Um, it's, it's a mis misconception that we're only prosecuting the very dangerous people that come into the United States. That's just not true. And it's also a misconception that uh, these people are not doing any prison time when they get arrested and charged with these offenses. That's not true either. Um, a couple other uh, misconceptions I'd like to dispel is the notion of zero tolerance and uh, open borders or just total catch and release. Um, those, those, to me, I'm, I'm sure Andrew can talk to this better, but uh, they don't really exist in, in my world, what I've seen. Um, during the Clinton administration under Janet Reno running the, the Department of Justice, um, there was Operation Gatekeeper. 
which enhanced or, or greatly uh, increased the number of prosecutions for legal entry and re-entry. And the same thing occurred um, in 2019, 18 and 19 uh, under the Trump administration uh, with Jeff Sessions started Operation Streamline. And actually Operation Streamline started during the Bush administration, but in a very limited uh, capacity. And what the Trump administration did was um, greatly increase that or enhance that. Um, the reason why that's not zero tolerance is because there's a finite amount of resources that the criminal justice system has. There's a finite amount of detention cells, holding cells, courtrooms, judges, marshals to transport these people, uh, lawyers, uh, prosecutors. Um, so there, it's, it, there, are, there is no way that the criminal justice system can, can have zero tolerance on everyone who, who uh, has an un unauthorized entry into the United States. It just can't be done. It, uh, we just don't have the infrastructure or the resources. So there has to be decision-making process from the Department of Justice is on, on, on how many people we prosecute, who we prosecute and what happens. And so um, it's, it's been fairly consistent since uh, the, the Clinton administration, the numbers, um, as far as the number of prosecutions. And, and again, these are the, the vast majority of all federal prosecutions. It did spike in 2019 under Operation Streamline. Um, for example, in 2016, the fiscal year 2016, and uh, President Obama's last term, there were 15,000, roughly uh, 15,000 prosecutions for illegal entry. In 2017, it was 15,000, 2018, 18,000. It spiked up to 22,000 in fiscal year 2019, again, due to Operation Streamline. But in, by 2020, that went back down to 19,000. Um, so it's been fairly consistent as far as the numbers of prosecutions. The people being prosecuted, again, it's, it's, it's very consistent on what we're seeing and um, their sentences have been uh, relatively the same as well. And so um, that's uh, basically has been my experience. I, I, I welcome any questions that anyone has about uh, these prosecutions and, and what happens here. Thank you. Thanks, Jerry. Um, can we now hear from Andrew? Do you have a few opening remarks? Sure. Um, my name is Andrew Niator. Th thanks very much for inviting me to, uh, to the meeting this afternoon. Uh, I'm a local attorney. I, I live in North Park and I work downtown. Uh, and I've been practicing um, in, mainly immigration law uh, for a little over 21 years here in San Diego. Um, we hear a lot about asylum in the news and what's happening at, at our border here in San Diego, the increase uh, in Central American refugees, uh, the Haitians in Texas from last month. So I thought I'd start by talking a little bit about asylum because it's a term we hear a lot. And I think there are some, um, some misconceptions about what asylum is and, and how you uh, obtain it. Um, just to speak very generally, uh, when somebody applies for asylum, they're basically saying that they have a fear of being persecuted uh, in their country of nationality on account of five very specific things. It has to be based on um, race, uh, religious beliefs, political opinion, uh, national origin or membership in some type of particular social group. So that could be somebody, you know, for instance, fleeing from Cuba because they were threatened uh, for their political activities against the current regime. Uh, it can be somebody from Iran because they can't practice their faith, uh, a family fleeing um, Guatemala because of being persecuted based on perhaps being an ethnic minority, um, somebody from El Salvador or Mexico because they're being targeted by by gangs who are working with the local law enforcement. So those are some of the, the more common um, bases that people would claim asylum. Um, so that's the law on asylum, and that's all codified in US law passed by Congress. Uh, and the law also lays out how somebody is supposed to apply for asylum. And that's where there's very often a conflict between what is supposed to happen and what actually happens. 
Um, so as an example, someone in, say, Mexico or Central America or, or most places uh, around the world, if somebody wants to apply for, for asylum, they can't just go to the local U.S. embassy and say, I'd like an application for asylum, please. They actually have to make it to the U.S. border. And then the, the, the U.S. law, which and also uh, international law, says that if somebody comes to our border, for instance, the San Ysidro Port of Entry, the, the CBP inspector, the Customs and Border Protection, is supposed to ask somebody, obviously, do you have documents to come into the United States? And if they say they don't, then they're supposed to be turned away, unless they claim a fear of being returned because of persecution. In other words, they have a basis for asylum. And at that point, the CBP officer, instead of returning them to possible persecution and death, is supposed to at least temporarily allow them to come into the United States so their uh, asylum claim can be heard. Um, now, what happened during the Trump administration is that they essentially ignored all those requirements, um, as in the law, um, and refused to let almost anybody in, even if they had uh, a legitimate fear. Um, and that created this massive refugee settlement um, across our border in, in Tijuana and all across the border, uh, California, Texas, all these essentially refugee camps uh, that included you know, refugees, families, um, and over time, as people were there for weeks and months, they essentially became desperate. They were being targeted by, by gangs and smugglers, and many of them started, because they had no choice, started going further east from um, uh, San Ysidro and, and Tijuana into the desert and trying to cross over for the purpose of applying for asylum, by the way. Um, and now enter the Trump administration's Operation Streamline and Zero Tolerance, the family separation policies, all those things, some of those things Jerry mentioned, and many of those things you, you remember from you know, a few years ago, and those refugees are now being charged with federal crimes. Um, now, as, as Jerry can confirm, that, that period uh, was an absolute nightmare. Um, the, the local federal court in San Diego just became absolutely overwhelmed. They had to ship in extra judges just to handle uh, the, the numbers. And it was frankly one of the biggest wastes of resources I've ever seen. Um, besides being some of the most cruel policies uh, that this country has ever put in place. Um, I, I think it's what, what's shocking to, to a lot of people is, you know, if I say federal court, I uh, imagine most people think of you know, big white collar crime offenses and bank robberies, uh, maybe because we're in San Diego, you know, drug trafficking offenses and these gang conspiracy prosecutions. So, so I think a lot of people are really shocked when they hear that number that, that Jerry uh, gave just like a few minutes ago, that between half and 70% of the cases in federal court are immigration cases. Uh, I think that a lot of people are, are not aware of that. Um, the other policy that re really crippled the, the ability of refugees to seek any type of protection was something called you know, Title 19 and Title 42, which you might have, might have heard in, in the news. It was used by Trump to essentially shut down all asylum seekers. Um, under Title 42, the, the second of those, um, it was basically argued that uh, this, is a, this is a COVID-19 emergency, so we can't let anybody in uh, seeking asylum. You know, interestingly, just to underscore the, the hypocrisy of that, the ban only applied to people coming in at the land border, not to people flying in. So um, I, I assume I don't need to paint the profile here on, on the sort of people that have to walk to the port of entry seeking asylum versus the people who could afford to, to buy a plane ticket. Um, and apparently under the Trump administration, COVID-19 didn't apply to people on planes. Um, but un unfortunately, the, the current administration has kept some of those policies in place. Uh, they just announced last week that they were going to be rolling back the Title 19 um, restrictions. Those are the ones that basically said uh, any non-essential travelers can't come. Those are basically people with, with uh, visas. But the Title 42 that directly affected uh, asylum, unfortunately, uh, the current uh, administration for now has kept those in place, but there's a lot of pressure uh, to release those. Um, and so with that backdrop, you have the number of of Haitians that you heard about in the news last month that were rounded up um, under the bridge in, in Texas. Um, and then just the, the, the large number of people that still are in these refugee camps right across our border in, uh, in Tijuana. 
Um, I think the, the, the last thing I want to briefly review for you, um, apart from the asylum situation, is, is what immigration court is like. Um, immigration court in the United States is, is not um, an independent court the way we think of federal court or state court. And actually, immigration court is a branch of the Department of Justice. Um, immigration judges are not independent judges. They're employees of the Department of Justice. Uh, and in court, there's an attorney representing the government, uh, a licensed, experienced attorney working for the Department of Homeland Security uh, for ICE. And then you have the immigrant who in immigration court has no rights to an appointed attorney. Um, and that includes children, by the way, with some quite shocking accounts uh, of children who have to appear in immigration court by themselves. Um, and, and by the way, why that matters is that statistically we know that uh, just with asylum, people who have an attorney in asylum proceedings are five times more likely to win their claim for asylum than somebody who, who does not have an attorney. And a lot of that is, is because asylum is not an easy process, that the person applying for uh, asylum has the burden to prove their case. And that includes people who are being detained, who somehow are supposed to come up with documentation and, and declarations and notices and, and court records from their home country where they're fleeing and they're afraid to go and now they're detained. So it, it's almost impossible for somebody who's um, detained, even if they have an absolutely valid claim uh, to win asylum, uh, unfortunately. Um, something specific to San Diego, by the way, that the, the, um, the, the County Board of Supervisors a, a few months ago uh, authorized the creation of a program to assist um, immigrants in immigration court. This is something that's happening across the country. A, a lot of cities in California are doing this, and a lot of uh, cities across the country, New York is doing this. Uh, and there's also some legislation in, uh, in Congress to have some type of federal program uh, to better ensure some type of, of due process and fairness uh, to immigrants in, in immigration court. Um, and so that, that's, that's the overview that I wanted to provide, and I understand that might be a, a Q&A at, at the end, but uh, that, that's my overview, and um, I believe, uh, was it uh, Odd was going to, to pick up from there? Yes. Um, Odd, are you uh, ready to make some opening remarks? Yes, thank you. Thanks for having me, um, and thanks for supporting PANA. Um, so I worked at PANA, the Partnership for the Advancement of New Americans. We are a nonprofit located in City Heights. Um, we focus mostly on doing advocacy for refugees here in San Diego. Uh, we do work with some asylum seekers. Um, and I joined the team a few months ago as their staff attorney to sort of like help people whenever they have questions. Um, a lot of those questions are about immigration. Um, as you can imagine, um, my colleagues describe how convoluted the system is and how sometimes complicated it is to navigate it. Um, so the people I work with, they're ref many of them are refugees, which means that unlike asylum seekers, they come already with some sort of status. Um, oftentimes after having spent years and years in uh, camps, in UN camps, waiting to be resettled. Um, so a lot of the people I work with currently are from Africa, they're Middle Eastern or um, South Asian. Um, and we do work with some asylum seekers, so people will come at the border and ask for asylum. Um, just to go back on like what my colleague said previously, like the crime immigration is the intersection of criminal and immigration law. Um, and it encompasses everything that basically criminalizes immigration. Um, so it's people being detained and prosecuted at the border uh, for illegal entry or illegal reentry when many of those people are actually trying to seek asylum, which is an international right. Um, but the other um, sort of aspect that I think Jerry talked about a little bit is also um, the consequences of criminal law and criminal offenses and convictions for people who are in the United States and are not US citizen. Um, so you would be surprised because, as Jerry said, oftentimes in, on TV or in the news, we hear about, you know, like, oh, let's let's get those like murders and rapist immigrants out of the country. But um, over half of the people who end up in immigration proceedings before because of a criminal um, an encounter with criminal law enforcement 
Um, it usually um, starts with like a traffic stop. So many, many states still have uh, complete open collaboration between um, immigration services and local law enforcement agencies. And so some people might get stopped for not having the proper driver license or um, some sort of traffic violation. And from there end up in the pipeline of immigration deportation. Um, and as Andrew said, like there is no immigration provided in immigration court. So unless people are able to afford an attorney or figure it out on their own, um, in addition to the fact that there are not that many relief that people can apply for, um, the, the system is really stacked up against these people. Um, in, in sort of like the broad, like the, the wide range of how this come up in people's life, we've had, um, and especially here at the southern border, um, a lot of people who have been green card holders have been living here in the U.S. for years and years, sometimes their entire lives, and they end up being deported. One group that was in the news, that has been in the news for the past couple of years, um, are vets, people who have been fighting in the army, went overseas, and then oftentimes have some sort of PTSD or some issues coming back from war. And then they might end up, you know, having some sort of issue with the criminal justice system and those people end up being deported. Um, the other thing is, you know, when people are um, being in immigration proceedings, whether it's because they were crossing at the border, whether it's because they were picked up, you know, somewhere um, inside the country, um, those people, in addition to not having an attorney, might sometimes spend years in immigration detention. So in theory, immigration detention is civil detention. It's not there to punish people. It's not criminal detention. And yet it's the exact same thing. In fact, sometimes immigrants are being housed in um, the same buildings as other people um, serving their criminal sentence. So for families, it could mean someone is, you know, taken away um, after serving their sentence. So for instance, let's imagine two people. One was born in the United States, one was born somewhere else and has a green card. Um, both of them get convicted of the same thing. Um, the difference is the person born here gets to go home once they serve their sentence. The person who was born abroad might end up in deportation proceedings. And that is no matter what a crime was, basically, because under immigration law, um, it doesn't really matter if someone was convicted of just a misdemeanor or a felony. There's just very different and convoluted categories of crimes that make you deportable. But for that person who all of a sudden, you know, doesn't get to go home, although they have a green card and end up in the removal proceedings, that could mean years in immigration detention. That could mean families where, you know, one of the parents gets taken away. So that's like financial hardship, hardship on the kids. Um, and so the ramifications of the criminal immigration go further than just um, the one person put into the system. Um, one of the other thing is in terms of like the, the crossings, the, the, the offenses being um, charged with like the illegal entry, illegal re-entry, uh, those were, I think those have been created about a hundred years ago um, in the late 1920s. Um, and those were clearly for one reason. They weren't to make the country safer. They weren't to make um, this space more peaceful. It was for one only reason to deter immigration. That has never worked. Um, and so throughout the years, some administrations just never used this um, 13, the, the 1325 and 1326, which are the two um, offenses. And then some like the Trump administration um, had decided like, well, everybody needs to get prosecuted, which is why also in the news, sometimes we hear just like, wow, there's the surge of immigrants and, you know, they're crossing everywhere. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that this is true. This is just means that at some point we decided that everyone trying to come would be criminalized for trying to come to the US. Um, and that ended up like my colleague Professor said about like in 2018, 2019, I think two thirds of the federal prosecutions were related to immigration. Um, I have many more things to say, but I'll just stop here so that maybe we can open to questions. 
Thank you, um, all three panelists. That was very interesting um, opening remarks. I know that we have a uh, question in the chat from Dave Myers. Would you like to uh, come on and ask your question directly of the panelists? Sure, and it has to do with local law enforcement, the Trust Act in California, the inner um, workings of the U visa for victims and witnesses, and the fact that local law enforcement historically, especially the sheriffs, have allowed ICE and shared information with ICE and how that affects and impacts communities. I'll, I'll start that. Um, yeah, Dave, this is one of the most frustrating um, aspects of, of how immigration law um, plays out on, on the local level. Um, because local law enforcement is not supposed to be cooperating with ICE. Essentially, we're not supposed to be using those resources for the federal responsibility of enforcing immigration law. Um, but across the state, including uh, in, in San Diego at times, um, we've seen blatant disregard of that restriction and uh, the sheriffs um, will notify ICE directly when they know there's a non-citizen detained at one of their facilities. Um, and some of it is extremely frustrating because even when they uh, decide that, when they say that they're going to start following the law, which you would hope the sheriff would do, they'll find these little backdoor ways, uh, pardon my language, to screw people. Uh, and they'll say, oh, we're not, we're not gonna notify um, ICE anymore. But what we're gonna do is, we're gonna create a list of everybody who's about to be released uh, on bond uh, and you know, maybe that will indicate what their immigration status is, and that's available to the public. So as you can imagine, um, there's somebody in ICE going through that list every day. Um, so some of it can be very uh, disingenuous, um, and um, I don't know if any, any other uh, two guests have any other thoughts on that. Odd or Jerry, do you have uh, uh, um, any further comments on the question? Um, just, just one comment. Um, I agree with everything um, Andrew just said. Um, I would just point out that some people, and, and in part, particularly the sheriff, um, were big opponent of this type of policy. They were like, we want to collaborate with ICE because we do think it makes the community safer. Um, and this is not true. We see that from the states that continue to allow this kind of collaboration. Um, and so... I think the act is here to stay and, and advocates are working, like people on my team are working on this and like a lot of immigrant rights activists are working on this. But I would say that also beyond the fact that the sheriff sometimes doesn't wanna uh, really cooperate with the act, um, there are also additional issues that we're noticing in terms of how they're supposed to report this to the attorney general um, and how this information that is supposed to be accessible to the public is in fact not really accessible at all. Um, and how, you know, those issues are important for everyone to be aware of and continue to like, like bring accountability to that because it's not just about the immigrants who are picked up at that time, but also more than for us to understand what is law enforcement doing um, and how they're working with the immigrant. Um, law enforcement agencies. And the other issue related to something that Dave mentioned about uh, U visas is with well, this collaboration between law enforcement and ICE, um, it really undermines the, the trust within the community of working with law enforcement, reporting crimes, reporting being a victim, and that is not good for the community. Um, and so when people are afraid to go to the police because they're concerned that their information is gonna be turned over to ICE, that emboldens people to take advantage of an already vulnerable population. Thank you, Andrew, that's right on. Thank you guys. Um, we have another question in chat from Doug Case uh, asking to discuss the reports this week that the, that the Biden administration will be continuing the remain in Mexico policy. Is that a change in position or the result of a court determination uh, the administration could not it can discontinue this policy? What's the path ahead? That is Maybe. the result of a, of a court decision. Um, so it, it is not because of any change in 
policy within the Biden administration. The Biden administration, you know, th- there have been some fr- frustrations with the Biden administration on immigration issues, but um, they have been consistent in opposing the Remain in Mexico MPP program. Um, but because of a court decision, they are technically supposed to not discontinue it because uh, not to get too technical, whenever you change uh, any type of policy in a significant way, it does need to go through some type of process where the community is supposed to have uh, input to changes in the regulations. So um, the, the court said that when the MPP, pro- the Remain in Mexico program was discontinued, it was in a way done too abruptly. So technically it needs to be reinstated, but I would I would hope and imagine that it is not going to be um, robustly uh, utilized by the current administration the way it was uh, in, in the Trump administration. And eventually, I, I do expect that it will be discontinued officially. I have a slightly more nuanced answer to that. Oh, sorry. Um, just to add to what Andrew said, what's the what's the path ahead? Like, we're just going to keep fighting. Um, immigrant rights activists have been going to court for years and years now, and they're just going to keep doing this. Um, The Biden administration on its first day said we're done with MPP. Um, And by the way, I don't know if everyone know what this Remain in Mexico policy is, but it's basically a violation of asylum law where Trump had decided that if people wanted to seek asylum, they would have to stay in Mexico while their asylum case in the U.S. would be completed. So those people would be... um, allowed to come in the U.S. just to go to their hearing, the day of the hearing, and then they would have to stay in Mexico, which would take sometimes years because of the backlog in immigration court. Um, That policy has many, many issues, and one of them is people were not able to get to their hearing. They were not able to get documents that they were having hearing, Um, and some of them actually were having terrible situations in Mexico. Some of them have reported being kidnapped at the time they were supposed to be in court. So yeah, they couldn't show up to court. But then when um, that lawsuit a few weeks ago um, reinstated the policy, the judge, the district judge actually used a lot of those um, factually incorrect basis saying, well, if people didn't show up to court, it's because maybe they didn't really have an asylum case. And so deterrence is working through uh, Remain in Mexico policy, and it's not. Um, So the next step is the administration just um, presented a memo yesterday and was meeting with um, immigrant rights um, advocates and activists in like how to best implement this Remain in Mexico policy to make it as soft as possible until they're able to actually get completely rid of it. But it's gonna take a quite a bit of time, I guess. Um, and it's gonna be like another couple of months at least where people are gonna to have to suffer through this policy. One of the darkest things about Remain in Mexico was how it really took the image of what asylum seekers and refugees go through and tried to hide it sort of out of mind, out of the conversation. Um, And so I I know a a lot of us in in the community had the opportunity um, to go down to Tijuana. I actually went out to Texas to to Matamoros uh, across from Brownsville to look at some of those uh, refugee camps as well. And they are absolutely horrendous. The the sanitary conditions are absolutely third world. I can't imagine anybody um, trying to survive in those camps. Forget about if you have a family with, with children it, it's just absolutely heartbreaking to see uh, what the people are going through you know, through the winter months and through COVID. It's absolutely atrocious. And the other thing that the, that the Trump administration did as part of Remain in Mexico is they tried to establish the, the courts um, in the, um, w- w- within the ports of entry. And so they said, everybody needs to stay in Mexico. We'll set up court for you, but it's going to be this special court now. Um, it really was just a secret court. And I, as a licensed attorney, was barred from going in to watch a court proceeding. That is absolutely horrifying, just from a, uh, not, not to sound too pollyannish but just from a, a point of view of, of democracy that I can't go into what is supposed to be a public courtroom because they decided to put it on a port of entry base and now say that that's uh, a security issue. And so nobody's allowed to go in. Um, so that there were some really, really bad humanitarian, due process, you name it, problems 
with with Remain in Mexico. Um, and so the, the fact that this thing is not dead with the last nail in the coffin is, is certainly up, upsetting and, and concerning. But uh, like I said, the, the, the fight continues there. Uh, and and may, maybe technically it, it's back, but um, we're not going to let it uh, get very far. Um, thank you, Andrew and, and Odd. Um, are there uh, any further questions in the audience? Uh, Doug Case, I think you have a question. Would you like to, to pose it? Yes, yeah, a follow-up question to the question I just asked. Uh, the news reports indicated they would be continuing, continuing the Remain in Mexico contingent upon the cooperation of Mexican governments. My question is, what is the Mexican government doing to alleviate the situation at the border with those people that are being returned, either as uh, asylum seekers or others? Um, Jerry, would you like to take this one? I'll, I'll, no, no, no. This, this is uh, odds and, and Andrew's ballywick, not mine. Okay, okay. This is more civil related. Okay. If we have criminal questions. Um, I'll get to those. <laughs> Okay. I, I would say that the, the, the main problem with, 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 with that question, Doug, is it's not so much what is Mexico willing to do, but what, what are they capable of doing? And they, they just don't have the, the, the resources, the, the capability, the, the, the manpower. Um, and if, if you look at the, the, the best those camps ever looked uh, in Matamoros and in, in Tijuana, if, if that's the best the Mexican government could do, um, then, I mean, uh, they, they can say that they are planning to cooperate all they want, but they, they, I mean, they haven't been able to um, provide much assistance. Um, and so the, the people that have the most influence there are unfortunately uh, the gangs and, and the cartels and, and the smugglers. Um, and a lot of the Mexican police themselves are often afraid to go into these facilities because they are being operated by um, criminal organizations. And um, I, I don't know what else to say other than, you know, a, a lot of the people that are fleeing uh, Latin America are, are Mexicans themselves um, because of the corruption uh, of the Mexican government and Mexican law enforcement. So I, I, I'd be cautious about putting too much stock into pledges of, of, of Mexico to provide support. I, I do think that there are some good faith efforts to do it, um, but I just don't think that they, they have the, the, the capability based on what we've seen so far. Yeah, it sounds like a human rights disaster to me. Well, it is. And actually, actually, this is where this could be a loophole into like ending the policy or at least not really reinstating the policy because I believe the memo mentioned that um, Mexico has to be cooperating for um, MPP to work. And so I guess there could be some just politing, political move from Mexico saying we're not going to be part of this anymore. Um, I doubt they'll do that, but, you know, one can always be hopeful. Thank you for that. I also think um, a, lot of what Mexico, a, lot, a lot of what Mexico did in the, in, in the Trump administration was because of, you know, a lot of the, the pressure that, that Trump put on the Mexican government basically threatening them that they better cooperate. Um, I, I would hope that we now have a better, more respectful relationship with Mexico, that they wouldn't feel compelled to, uh, to participate, like, like all I was mentioning. Thank you both. Um, I think Angela Hawkins has a question. Would you like to pose it? Yes, so with regard to the fact that there are laws that have essentially um, set up the situation where so many people are being charged criminal action when it's absurd that that's actually happening. Is there legislation that could be supported that um, would be able to change this? Or is this gonna require a major overhaul in immigration law, which has seems to have been bottlenecked for years? Do you have any hope either on the local level or on the federal level? Um, you want me to take that, guys? <laughs> um, sure. Well, yeah, I was going to mention, uh, I, I'd mentioned earlier that the uh, 
1325, the illegal entry law was enacted around 100 years ago. I, she's right, it was, I believe it's sometime in 1929, or early 30s. And it was, uh, I just wanted to, before I forget, it was directly targeted at uh, prosecuting Latin Americans uh, because uh, European immigrants and Asian immigrants, they were, their, their immigration levels were limited by uh, quotas and bans. And so the, these illegal entry uh, laws were directly targeted at uh, Latin Americans. The, and the number of prosecutions, um, it, it was fairly high when the law was first enacted up until about 1940. And then it dropped down to a very low level where people were not really, like Lot said, people, uh, uh, the Fed, federal government was not using this law to prosecute people that much up until about the Clinton administration. And then it really went um, uh, increased during the Bush administration and it's been pretty consistent since. But I think one answer to your question is, is a, a, a big factor here is the prosecutorial decision by the Department of Justice and how many people they decide to prosecute or not prosecute. Um, to bring the levels more in line with who should really be prosecuted the most, you know, the, the, the people who are violent or, or, or those low level uh, numbers that we see of the very people who have very serious criminal offenses in our past. Um, I think that's more realistic to think that that would happen than a, a legislative change, but I'll, I'll let my colleagues discuss that. So on the legislative side and the political side, um, you know, since this is a, a Democratic club, I, I would um, direct your attention to people like uh, Julian Castro. Um, you know, Julian Castro has spoken directly on the use of these 1325 and 1326 statutes to, to prosecute people. And so it's going to take, you know, uh, people like him to make this an issue that um, gets some type of leverage uh, in, in Congress. I mean, these are these are federal laws. And so if there's going to be a change, it needs to be made on the federal level. And that I, I suppose it, it can be done two ways. W one way would be what Jerry was re referencing and how um, the prosecuting agencies, like the U.S. Attorney's Office, um, decides as a matter of discretion how to use these statutes and, and whether to use these statutes. Um, but also on the legislative side about whether this can be either part of a, a larger um, package of immigration reform or, or just uh, address the, the history of 1325s and 1326s and get Congress to say, you know, maybe this isn't an appropriate law that essentially is being used to, to criminalize um, civil immigration matters. Oh, thank you for that. Um, I think there's a couple more questions, Dave. Uh, I, I think there's uh, questions from Dave Myers. Would you like to pose those questions, Dave? Sure, it is. I, I think Jerry was the one talking about um, criminal law, and it has to do with his, if he has a frustration with the ability, since local law enforcement comes in contact with lots of immigrants who may be victims and or witnesses, with the lack of policies and practices of local law, or, uh, law enforcement to ensure U visas are afforded to those individuals. And also, any of the panelists have any comments on the 287G program? Um, I, I, again, I, I, I'll uh, give that to Andrew or Odd. I mean, I, I think that's, that's more of a civil law question with the U visas and, and witnesses and things in that nature. Yeah, with, with the U visas, I, I think that, um, you know, one thing that's happening in, in California is, you know, out of Sacramento, that there have been attempts to really encourage law enforcement agencies to be more open to participating in the U visa process. So, so those who don't know, a, a U visa is um, a, a visa for somebody who's a victim of a certain type of crime and has suffered some type of injury uh, and cooperates with law enforcement. And so the, the most common would be somebody who's a victim of like, uh, certain types of domestic abuse or assault. Um, and so th those individuals to encourage them to, to report their crimes and to assist law enforcement, they can be eligible for a certain type of visa called a U visa. It requires that the police or some uh, office um, certify 
that they cooperated with law enforcement. And so th there has been some inconsistency uh, across California. You know, certain cities were known to be more open to, certain, to signing those certifications and others have been much more stingy. Uh, and so uh, out of Sacramento, there have been attempts to basically say, listen, law enforcement, listen, sheriff offices across California, if somebody comes to you and is a victim, you should be encouraging them to participate as, as a witness. You should be encouraging them and you should be signing those certifications that is, is not granting them any type of immigration benefit, just confirming that they did what they needed to do with law enforcement. And then they can then take that and try to get this U visa. And so I, I think that there is a role for law enforcement in being more liberal in granting the certifications for U visas. Um, and in terms of education, I think most, Frankly, most of the education, I think Odd would probably speak to this more, comes from a lot of uh, community-based organizations that work in the community to let people know what their rights are and, and what their options are and about the U visa, because otherwise, I, I don't think we can rely just on law enforcement to be educating people in the community and advocating for them to actually apply for U visas. That might be you know, uh, not the most uh, appropriate uh, ask of, of law enforcement directly. Yeah, one thing I would just add also with the U visa is that um, the process is pretty lengthy. So even when law enforcement actually agrees to certify the documentation for the U visa, there is a backlog. Um, I think it's only 10,000 U visa per year that can be issued. So um, for people, it doesn't necessarily give them immigration protection or relief right away. Um, but this is definitely an option that is helpful for many people who um, still want to report the crime and, and assist law enforcement. But definitely there is a lack of information for people knowing that they could be eligible for that relief. So, yeah, I guess I mean, if if law enforcement agencies were more um, interested in, in sharing that information with people, that would be great. But I think right now it mostly comes from um, nonprofit organizations. Uh, thanks. I believe uh, Gary Gartner has his hand raised. Would you like to uh, pose your question? Yeah, it's more of a comment about the U visa um, because I've uh, experienced personally trying to help a, a friend in the Bay Area who was attacked um, over a year ago in, um, in East Oakland and got the U visa, got the um, police department in Oakland to sign for it. I helped him through the whole process. And, um, and we worked through Senator Feinstein's office and this, that, and the other. And it's just, the immigration system is so effed up in this country, it's, it's maddening. It makes me very angry to try to help this guy. Um, so at any rate, they're, they're years behind in, in, um, in issuing these U visas. And so, you know, I talked to Feinstein, the aide, and said, you know, he's trying to be legal in this country and you're and the country's our country's going to force him to you know break the law work illegally whatever he's used all of his savings from um bangladesh where he's from so now finally he it seems that the biden administration is has um pushed to help more people so he's actually gotten his uh his fingerprinting and stuff done so we're hoping that sooner than later he's going to be able to actually get that U visa, but it's, it's, it's really crazy. That's all. Thanks, Gary. Uh, there's a question in chat from David Mosley. Would you like to pose it? Yeah. Are uh, people facing trial or court for immigration concerns in general able to be referred for competency evaluations if they seem like they don't understand the proceedings. It sounds like the immigration system is a little different. And then Jerry, are you able to refer your clients for criminal matters for insanity evaluations as well? Uh, yes, uh, any, any, in order for someone to be uh, brought to trial, they have to be deemed competent to do so by the court. So if uh, an attorney feels that his client is not competent to do so, then it's, it's uh, that, attorney's responsibility to bring that to the court's attention and to have his client evaluated for competency. 
And competency means under the federal law, they, they have to know the charges, uh, what they're being charged with the consequences and able to properly assist in their defense. And so, uh, yes, if, if someone's charged with illegal entry or re-entry and we feel that like they're not competent to proceed uh, due to a, a mental illness, then we have that responsibility to have them evaluated. That's, that's pretty rare. We don't see that that often, especially with those cases. Um, that's typically the, the more bank robbery type of cases where, you know, these guys are very mentally ill. Um, but um, it, it does, it, it occurs. I, I've seen it every now and then, but it, it's pretty rare. Um, but I'm not sure about the immigration. Uh, I'll let my colleagues talk about the immigration proceedings. Yeah, in, in immigration court, uh, as, as we we're talking about earlier, um, you know, people in immigration proceedings have no rights to appointed counsel. And that, for a long time, uh, included people with significant mental health issues. And it took a case, it was um, a class action suit called Franco v. Holder uh, from, I believe, 2018 that went all the way to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, where the, the, the Federal Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit finally said, this is ridiculous. Um, people who are incompetent, who are not even entitled to an attorney, cannot represent themselves in these complicated deportation proceedings. So in this very small group within the Ninth Circuit, which only encompasses certain states, um, there is now a requirement that people with significant mental health issues who are detained and in immigration proceedings um, be given an evaluation and be given some type of legal assistance. That is now being expanded uh, to other parts of the country, um, but it is still one of the very few areas where um, people in immigration court can now get uh, legal assistance. So I, I'd like to pose a question myself here, since there's none in the in the queue at the moment. So what happens when a person is charged with an immigration crime? Do they just go to prison? Do they just get deported? I mean, what is the typical outcome in in court? What's interesting is that when they put into place Operation Streamline and Zero Tolerance that mostly Jerry was talking about earlier, a lot of these individuals were people who were coming into the United States specifically to apply for asylum. So instead of coming to the port of entry as they're allowed to do under U.S. law and saying, I have a fear, um, I want to apply for asylum and letting them come in and make their case, they were not being allowed to even ask. Uh, they would be being put in these desperate situations, and many were crossing over without permission you know, through the desert uh, and caught. And even if it was clear that they were there to uh, request asylum, they were put in federal criminal custody, referred to the U.S. Marshals, referred to the U.S. Attorney's offices, and prosecuted for illegal entry or illegal reentry cases, and many times having to do custody time. And what happened at the end of that? They were then transferred to immigration custody so that they can apply for asylum, which is what they wanted to do in the first place. So that is one of the, you know, Kafkaesque type nonsense that we saw during the Trump administration, a lot of which we, we, a lot of which we still see now, um, but people who are just fleeing for their lives often have to deal with the criminal system first and then hopefully be given an opportunity uh, to request um some type of immigration uh, relief, such as asylum, once that that's over. And, and if I could just piggyback on that too, uh, the other Kafka-esque situation that, that Operation Streamline caused is that, remember, there's a finite amount of resources that we have. And um, when you prosecute more people for illegal entry and reentry, that's taking away resources from the other cases that people would typically think would be more serious, and namely drug offenses. So what we saw is a lot less drug smuggling offenses being prosecuted in federal court because all these illegal entry cases were taking up, you know, the court space, the jail space, the, the holding cells. And so, you know, in, in essence, uh, it was benefiting drug smugglers um, to have these zero tolerance policies in, in, in effect. Um, a lot of these cases were being transferred to South Bay Court for prosecution, but, you know, that overburdened that system as well, and they were facing much less sentences in, in state courts and federal court. So that, that's another ramification of this 
so-called zero tolerance policy. Wow, crazy. <laughs> so do we have any uh, further questions from the, from the group for our panel? I have a follow-up question. Okay. But it, okay. Um, so if when somebody's facing immigration courts and not jury's uh, scope of things, if they're not entitled to an attorney, are there concerns about um, competency being accurately, like questions of competency being accurately reported or brought to concern if it's just a judge and the opposing side's attorney? Are there times when nobody says anything because it's going to speed stuff up because there's so much going on that, you know, it takes forever to get a competency evaluation anyway. Absolutely. I mean, anybody who knows anything about people with mental health issues knows that it is not something that manifests itself the same way at, in every moment. And so to say that, okay, you're entitled to uh, an attorney or some type of legal assistance if there's evidence that you have a mental health uh, issue. That, that's, that's exactly the, the right question. Well, who's making that decision? And essentially, in, in many cases, it's up to the immigration judge who's trying to juggle the cases every day to say, hey, that guy seems like he must, might be suffering from PTSD or schizophrenia. You know, th these are immigration judges. They're not mental health experts. And so I have absolutely no doubt that there are many people falling through the cracks that have significant mental health issues that nobody would catch because there's no appropriate mechanism to identify these individuals to basically put them on that track to begin with. So there's still a long way to go. One thing I would add to that is also that in immigration court, um, when people don't speak English, which is um, the majority of people, um, they are entitled to an interpreter providing by the court. It's often someone over the phone. Um, and this is also just a whole mess itself. So judges are not necessarily culturally competent. They're not really trained into understanding um, how you know customs work in different countries. So sometimes you see something as a person and think something is going on, but then really the, the, the person, the immigrant was trying to say something else. The interpreter didn't catch that. So there is also all this like barriers around it that make it even more complicated for those who have competency issues because they might not be even able to like raise that as an issue. I believe uh, Angela has her hand raised. So as we mentioned earlier, we are a democratic club and often our members like to be able to do things to um, help support good work or whatever we might be able to do in response to this challenge that is presented to us. So do you all have suggestions as to what our club members might be able to do? Are there organizations that need donations? Um, if you could speak to that. From a political point of view, I, I would say that you know, showing your support to um, um, the County Board of Supervisors for their initiative to fund uh, a program to provide services to uh, um, people in removal proceedings. I, I think that is something that would be uh, very welcomed by, by our elected representatives because usually the only people that show up to these meetings are people that are you know, screaming and, and spitting about uh, you know, how they're being treated unfairly and wh where's their money going. Um, and so I, I believe Nathan Fletcher is, is the uh, is the uh, supervisor for, for OB in Point Loma, I, I believe. He was very much in support of that. Um, uh, I believe it was, um, uh, well, I, I don't want to misstate anybody's position, but the, the majority of people on the uh, County Board of Supervisors supported this. I know Nathan Fletcher was one of them. And so letting them know that you support that initiative, when you see that there's a, a council meeting, you know, think about maybe uh, writing in a comment or, or phoning in to express your support for that, I think would be great. Um, and I think that at, from a practical point of view, may, maybe odd being more tied into community-based organizations have some, has some suggestions for, for that uh, way you can help as well. Yeah, definitely showing up at the Board of Supervisor meetings is important. City council meetings when they have um, some topics on immigration. Um, overall, just being informed and, and trying to be, you know, 
informed with like the real stuff and not the misconceptions. That's already something that's huge. A lot of our work oftentimes is just like, you know, talking about misconceptions and things that people misunderstood because it's hard to get reliable information. Um, volunteer, if you're in, if anyone has time and you're interested, like, you know, most at least nonprofit organizations, they can use the help if, if people want to do um, you know, some sort of research, working with people. There are ways to get involved at the local level, um, especially now uh, with the Afghan crisis. You know, we are getting a lot of Afghans resettled in San Diego. Um, so there are plenty of ways you can just get active in the community. You could have just like, you know, a little roundtable conversation to help other people understand. Um, there are plenty of ways for you to get involved. Okay, do we have any other questions uh, in the group? Okay, well, I think we went just slightly over time. And I'd like to thank uh, Jerry, Andrew, and Odd uh, so much for um, your time today and uh, explaining some things that are definitely not uh, um, well explained in the media. So, so thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank thank everybody. Yes. Uh, everyone's on mute, so it's hard to applaud or whatever, but they can come off applause or show with the reaction buttons. But thank you all very, very much. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Oh, yes. So, yeah, hopefully everybody can... Um, um, see, uh, let's see. I'm trying to show a background here. I'm, I'm screwing it up probably, but um, to show the, on the agenda. Um, but the, but yeah, the next topic we had then on the agenda was just to give a little bit of a background on um, uh, endorsements. Yeah, an endorsement season getting underway for the primaries for next year. So let's see. It may seem very early, but the primaries next year revert to the normal kind of timing. Um, that being a non-presidential election year, the primaries in California will be in June. And then filing for those will close in March. So June the 7th is the first Tuesday in June is the primary, and March the 11th is when filing closes. So just to let everybody know, on the local party level, how it works is that for the party to take a position and endorse a candidate in a race, um, either filing has to have closed or the party needs to determine ahead of time that that race is strategically critical. And so what we'll see over the next coming uh, months is that the uh, meetings of the local party, um, which take place in five areas of the county, being such a large county, they split it into five areas. So the area caucus meetings, folks get together and decide whether to you know, deem whether a race is strategically critical or not. And then if it is, they could take up the endorsement and decide whether to endorse early before the close of filing. Um, and so Point Loma and OB Dems, we're in what they call the Metro West area. Um, the other areas are just kind of North, um, East and South, but people objected to calling us West because obviously North County is a lot further West than we are. So we're Metro West. So Metro West has a, uh, a proposed calendar coming up here whereby they would consider a friendly incumbent endorsement for Jen Campbell, for example, for City Council District 2 on November the 22nd. Which, when we discussed it at the e-board, we all thought was a, a little strange given that we won't know the boundaries of the City Council districts until the middle of December. Um, and it is possible I mean, who knows where they'll end up with the redistricting, but it is possible that either different candidates could get drawn into different districts or get drawn out of different districts. Uh, one possibility, for example, that's been discussed is that one of the candidates for City Council District 6, Joel Day, um, it's possible under some of the, the maps that are being proposed would end up in District 2 and therefore potentially, if he chose to, you know, could be a candidate in that race um, and could challenge the incumbent, um, that kind of thing. So I think um, 
most people are aware, I think Kip Eyshine is our uh, associate member for the club. He represents the club at the Metro West um, caucus meetings. And I think Kip, you, you attended the Council of Clubs meeting yesterday, and maybe you just want to take a, a few minutes just to give us an idea of how all this kind of works in practice. Yeah, the Council of Club meetings was entirely devoted to the endorsement process coming up. So I think that gives a good indication that a lot of the clubs are thinking about endorsements. A lot of the meeting was devoted to the rules and our endorsement committee chair and our president, you know, have always been really on, on top of that. So I think what I most took away from the meeting was that as a club, uh, we can instruct the associate member, me, to uh, vote a variety of different ways. If we want to do an endorsement, then we have to actually endorse at the club, and then I can only vote for what the club has endorsed to do. But we can also rate multiple candidates qualified. We can game out different situations for my vote at Metro West. So as we consider the endorsements, it's important to know that there are a variety of things we can do to get ready for that caucus vote. I don't know if that answers what you wanted me to answer, John, but that was yeah. my biggest takeaway, I think. Yeah, no, that's great. No, that's great. Yeah, so for example, then, the, the two that are coming up, and again, it's a similar thing, but the district's not really being known, is that on Monday, um, October the 25th, um, Metro West, right, um, the consideration of County Board of Supervisors District 4, then I mentioned November the 22nd, it'll be for uh, District 2, which is a friendly incumbent endorsement consideration. Um, and then in December 27th, because that's what everybody's doing a couple of days after some holiday that takes place that time of the year, on the 27th, there will be considerations in District 6 um, and also in the uh, County Board of Education District 5. And so, yeah, with some of these, Kip, for the friendly incumbent endorsements, my understanding is that the party deems that, be, that just one candidate being considered, the associate member is free to vote um, without the club having taken a position. But in District 6, for example, where there are multiple Democrats running and there is no in friendly, there is no incumbents, um, then the club would have to take a position prior to you being able to vote in that meeting. Yeah, that's right. Uh, the strategically critical designation for the race that John mentioned the associate member, me, can vote on that without the club. Uh, the friendly incumbent endorsements, the associate member can vote on without the club. But for any endorsement, uh, the associate member can only voice the club's opinion. Um, and so that would be subsequent to us holding an endorsement meeting for District 6 if, if we called for one as a club. That's great. No, thanks, Kip. So yeah, what we'll be doing, we've been, we've spoken, I know, a couple of times in the past about sending out a questionnaire. One of them will be to do in which races will be interested to take up endorsements. Um, the e-board has discussed it. Um, I think all city council races are important, not just our local district too, um, because obviously it's those nine individuals um, who vote on everything that affects what's going on in, in the city. So I think District 6 as well as District 2 is important. Um, and the other races that the party will be considering um, that it's of, of importance, and we'll, I'm sure some of the candidates will speak to in detail here, are again in that December timeframe, they'll be looking to do early endorsements in the county-wide races. So in the sheriff's race, um, you know, the DA's race or whatever, and the county assessor as well, they'll be looking to do early endorsements in those. The club doesn't get a vote in that, being associate members only vote at the areas and because there is a county-wide races, those that are determined by the central committee. But again, it may be that something we want to weigh in on, so at least we can attempt to influence some of the central committee members so they can see how clubs around the county, you know, what positions those are taking. Okay, are there any, any questions that anybody has on the, the upcoming uh, endorsements? I'm just going to drop my email just into chat here, just in case anyone has any questions about the endorsement meeting at the Council of Club last weekend or has any thoughts about some of the strategically critical race designations. So I'll just drop, drop that in. Obviously, the e-board is fully 
um, contactable, but I'll just drop my email just in case some of you haven't emailed me yet. Yeah, that's a great idea, Kip. Thank you so much. Yeah, and Angela, you have your hand raised. So, John, what are you proposing in that um, I'm assuming that the club would like to be able to have an endorsement vote for these various issues related to the critical um, race. So is that going to be determined in the questionnaire or should we be talking now about the fact that we should potentially schedule an additional meeting? Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, those are some, exactly, Angela. Those are some of the options we could put in there for the November meeting, for example, would be in time for some of the races. Um, you know, for the November 22nd meeting, the friendly incumbent endorsement, we could give guidance. Um, again, you know, prior to um, Kip voting at the meeting, he doesn't need that, right, to vote at the friendly incumbent meeting on the 22nd, um, because of the way the rules are done. But again, we could, we could do a, a position on that as to how people think we should vote. But then depending if there are a lot of races, I mean, there are a lot, potentially there's a lot of races you could take positions on, um, but again, you don't have a direct vote in. For example, you know, mayor's races in other local cities, Chula Vista, for example. Um, so there, there are some races I think the club may not want to weigh in on, but I imagine all the city, San Diego city council races um, would be the priority. Yeah, and I think we can accommodate those within the normal meetings that we have um, without having to do, you know, any special additional meetings. So that would be the a primary thing then for the November 21st meeting of the club. If, if we aren't going to have a meeting in December where we would do endorsements. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and, and November 21st is the next meeting, right, which will be on Zoom as well. So it'll be easy for folks to join. Um, and, and, and like we did last endorsement cycle, we'll do the voting with uh, electronic ballots as well. So even if people can't attend the meeting, they can still vote, um, you know, just beforehand. Okay. John, are you saying we might take up D6 on November, in November? Yeah, I, well, I suspect that's what people would like to do, yes. Okay, I, yeah. I think that would be great as well. Yeah, yeah, we've heard from many of the candidates, I think, in the last um, se several months, but maybe not all of them. So we, we would hope to invite all of them to be able to talk at the meeting uh, so people can make an informed uh, decision. That'd be great. Excellent. Okay. So with that, if there are no further questions, then we'll go to officer reports. Um, and I don't know, Kip, if you want to go first or. Sure. I think uh, in the last email after the uh, last meeting, we circulated the minutes of the October meeting. So I'm hoping some of the members uh, have had a chance to take a look at them and we can approve those uh, minutes uh, today. Ruth, is that your hand raised? Yes, but that was on your prior comment your, when I wanted to make a comment. Oh, it's, it's not a motion to approve the October minutes? Well, I, I will make a motion to approve the October minutes as you presented them. The September, right. September. Wait, are well, we talking about September or October? September, September. 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 Yes, this is October. He hasn't given us the minutes for this meeting yet. But they will come right after the meeting, so... <laughs> They'll be there, but okay, so we have a motion for September. Is there a second? I'll second it, Gary. Thank you. Anyone, well, John, I don't wanna yeah, start your yeah. roll call. Is there anyone uh, who uh, dissents from approving the September minutes? All right. Thank you, everybody. That's great. Thank you, Kip. Yeah. Okay. And if I may, since I had my hand up before that motion, I simply wanted to mention that today at seven o'clock, the Democratic Central Committee's Candidate Evaluation Committee is meeting. 
So we may have some new information after seven o'clock this evening. That's great. Thank you, Ruth. And then uh, Angela, do you want to go next? Yes. So um, our current balance in our bank account for the club is um, $9,506. Uh, we currently have 126 members, um, which is the, and again, if you recall, our membership is for the calendar year. So that's how many we've had in 2021. I did want to remind everybody that the way um, our club operates is that starting on November 1st in a calendar year, if you renew your membership, it will then go to the following December 31st. So if anybody is inclined to renew their membership um, early, you can start doing that as of November 1st, and that will be through December 31st, 2022. Um, otherwise, what we uh, encourage everybody to do is to renew your membership in January. And um, what that does is it makes, so if you are a current member, then it carries over your ability to continue as an active member. So um, the time frame um, for the 2022 memberships um, starts November 1. We encourage everybody to renew their membership in January. Um, but if you don't renew your membership by the end of March, then we um, have to take you off the uh, membership rolls. So just keep in mind the next few months to um, pay attention to our uh, renewal membership reminders. Um, I wanted to put forward some suggestions since we have $9,500 um, and we are coming up to that time of the year where we should be thinking about um, helping organizations. Um, we had a very impressive presentation last month um, from the Partnership for the Advancement of New Americans to support the Afghan refugees. And I thought that we should consider making a donation as a club to that organization. Um, and also um, there's a group, Casa Cornelia, that helps um, immigrants, um, which would be appropriate based on the um, presentations that we had today. Um, so I was, going to ask that we consider approving um, a contribution of $250 to each of those organizations. And I will make that as a formal um, action. So I move that the Point Loma Ocean Beach Democratic Club contribute $250 to Casa Cornelia and $250 to the Partnership for the Advance of New Americans to support Afghan refugees. I second that. Thank you. Okay, so we have a motion and uh, a second. So any discussion? Yes. Do we, if we have almost 10,000, why don't we donate more to them, like 500 apiece? I mean, it's just a thought. Okay. <laughs> Do you want me to then restate? Shall I restate the motion then? Could be a friendly uh, amendment, right? Or something. Well, if she just restates, we don't have to go through all that extra. All right. I So I withdraw my prior motion and I will change it to, I move that the Point Loma Ocean Beach Democratic Club contribute $500 to Casa Cornelia and $500 to the Partnership for the Advancement of New Americans to support Afghan refugees. Second. Okay, so we'll, 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 Doug, Doug, I'm sure will he'll put his fingers in his ears and give us all for, forbearance because I think everybody's in general support, but we'll, we'll question <laughs> that now then. Is there any further discussion on this topic for the motion at $500 for each organization? <laughs> Okay, here, hearing no more discussion, we'll move to a vote. Is there anybody opposed to the motion? Okay, there's nobody opposed. The motion carries uh, unanimously. Oh, that's great, and thank you very much. Thank you, Angela um, and, uh, and Ruth as well for up in the amount. Um, that's great. So John, can I then make a, a yet another motion? Sure. So um, last year, we 
wanted to make an effort to provide funding to local organizations. So an example of um, things more local to Point Loma and Ocean Beach specifically. Um, each year, the Ocean Beach has a holiday and to toy, sorry, holiday drive for toys and food for disadvantaged people in our community. Um, and I would like to make a motion for us to support the Ocean Beach Holiday Toy and Food Drive. Uh, what so, amount? So I was going to suggest that we do um, $500 for that. I'll second that. Okay, that's great. So we have a, we have a motion and, and a second. Um, is there any discussion? Great idea. Yeah, I agree. I think we've done this for several years. It's a very worthy organization. I know Gary Gartner, others are closely involved and, and they do a lot of great work in the community. So um, if there's no more discussion, we'll move to a vote. And again, the quickest way to do it is to say, is there anybody opposed uh, to the motion? Okay, nobody opposed, it's passed, Angela. So we can go ahead and make a donation to the OB holiday toy and food drive. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. That's great. Okay. You so do that, a great uh, job. Yes. No, absolutely. I think, yeah, I don't have a, a, any special report today, so we can go straight to um, any electeds or candidates that are running for office if they want to raise their hand um, in the participants tab or the reactions tab. Or, or not. Uh, let's see. I see. Yeah. Now, see. Yeah. Doug, you're up first. Yep. That's great. I will just one second. I will spotlight you here and get myself out of the way. That's good. Yep. Thanks. Okay. Doug. This is uh, Doug Case. I am the uh, political affairs uh, director for a Senate President Pro Tem, uh, Tony Atkins. Um, the legislature is currently in recess, but I think there were two bills uh, that were priority bills of the, the senator, uh, which were signed by the governor since our last meeting. Uh, the first of those is SB1, uh, which was her priority signature bill, which was the Sea Level Rise uh, Mitigation Adaptation Act, uh, which uh, provides funding for cities to deal with uh, sea level rise and also uh, requires that the Coastal Commission consider sea level rise in all their decisions. And the second uh, was a bill that she was a joint author with uh, Senator Bradford from Los Angeles. That is a bill which creates a certification process for uh, peace officers in the state of California. California was one of the few states that didn't have such a process. And so now there is a process and for to certify peace officers, which means that an officer can be decertified uh, if they engage in serious misconduct in one jurisdiction. So they could not be hired by another jurisdiction in the state of California. And then a couple of uh, budget items that were district wins uh, for our area. Uh, there were 50, there was $50 million in pure water for phase one. Uh, there was $35 million for UC San Diego Scripps Institute of Oceanography for a new research vessel to study our ocean and, and changing climate. Uh, $3 million for the San Diego Symphony Capital Improvement Programs for the Rady Shell, which is wonderful, by the way. Uh, $8.4 million for the OB Pier Capital Improvement Project and $30 million for the UC San Diego Hillcrest Medical Center for their replacement hospital. That's great. Right. Thanks, Doug. And then up next, we have Gary uh, Gartner. I had a question to Doug. Oh, sorry, Les. Yeah, go right no. ahead. Uh, as you didn't mention SB9, which was signed by the governor. I was wondering uh, what benefit to the community uh, is SB9, if you could explain to us. Yeah, well, that, that was, I mentioned that at the last meeting. Uh, well, SB9 addresses the issue of uh, housing protection in the uh, state of California and it provides a, a benefit to those that are owners of single family lots uh, to be able to split their lots. Uh, there's a lot of restrictions that are on that, uh, so you cannot have uh, investor properties. Uh, there's also protections for renters and, and historic districts as well as requirements to adhere to local zoning restrictions. But with God, regards to density, what benefit is that to the community? Well, the benefit to the community is that there is a severe housing crisis in the state of California, and this is just one way of addressing that. Uh, is, it probably is not going to have a significant impact on, on communities because there's a lot of restrictions on 
the use of uh, SB9, and it has to be something that the uh, homeowner is interested in doing. What were some of the alternatives? Well, that, I'm not sure what you're asking. I said, uh, what alternative? If you wanted to uh, provide more uh, housing for others in the community, what? Well, there, there, there's a lot of different bills. I mean, this is just one of a many package of bills uh, that the state legislature uh, considered and is considering. Uh, SB9 and SB10 were among other bills this past year that deal with uh, creating housing in, uh, uh, particularly in areas that are close to uh, transit. Thank you. Good, okay, yeah, so Gary, uh, thanks Doug, and Gary, you're up next. Okay, thank you. Um, I just wanted to share that the um, annual restaurant walk is coming up for Ocean Beach, and um, I think we're re reinventing it to call it the Taste of Ocean Beach, a, um, uh, I can't remember what I came up with, that. it's, um, it's a uh, food delicious fun. So that's going to be on November, Tuesday, November 9th. So it's three weeks away. And um, we're just finalizing the new logo and all that stuff. So hopefully by Tuesday or Wednesday of this week, it'll be on the website for the town council, obtowncouncil.org. And you can get your tickets. It always sells out, um, I'm told. I've only been to one of them uh, in 2019. So uh, it'll be 40 plus restaurants and breweries and that sort of thing. And everybody gets a taste at the ones you want to go to. We're trying to do it digitally this year. So you don't have any paper you need punched and just show your phone and they zap you in and you, or, and you get to get your sample food. Most, most of the restaurants have it outside. Um, so it should be a great event and all the money raised for that, which we're estimated to be maybe 30,000. Most of that money will go to the, uh, the food and toy drive uh, that'll go to over a hundred families, individuals and seniors in our community that uh, are in need, need uh, during the holidays. And then I just wanted to mention that uh, I've been part of a kind of a, a work group uh, working on the redistricting for strategy for the city. And um, we're working on a final map that we we sort of agreed with the people from La Jolla on uh, presenting to the redistricting commission. It, I believe that this, thir this Thursday is gonna be two meetings in the late afternoon, early evening from the redistricting commission. And I believe that they're going to release their initial map this week, but I can't swear to that. Um, but I believe that's the case. And so the idea is to try to keep the coastal area um, in a situation where we have representatives who are um, uh, committed and sensitive to the needs of the environment and the things that are important to us, planning, not tons of development and that sort of thing. Um, and the real question we dealt with this morning is, is whether Bay Ho would stay in the district, district two. It appears that it's likely that it will stay in district two, even though that's some of our some of us would prefer it to be in District 6. Um, our current council member lives in Bayho, so uh, she's likely to be still in District 2 for next year's election. But I mean, that's just our view. We'll see what the commission comes up with. Thanks. That's great. Thanks, Gary. And then I think up next we have... Uh, can, can I ask Gary a question? Yeah. Yeah, does your uh, proposal uh, keep uh, UCSD in a uh, district one? Uh, uh, yes, except for part of La Jolla, uh, the, the southern, south, southeastern end. We're, tr we're trying to be supportive of a genuine API empowerment district, not one that some of us, some of the people on our group uh, feel is really focused on helping um, what you might call real estate, a re real estate trust empowerment group rather than truly an API empowerment group. 
Sounds good. Yeah, no, thanks, Gary. Thanks, Doug, for the question. And then, yeah, we have Dave Myers, I think, if uh, if you want to go next for a couple of minutes on your candidacy. Sure. Thank you, John. Hi, everybody. My name is Dave Myers. I really, really appreciate the conversation tonight, which is why I put in the chat a lot of questions about immigration, because our current law enforcement coordinates with ICE. It allows ICE agents into our courthouses to look for immigration violations from domestic violence victims and witnesses. You know, I've served in law enforcement 35 years in a number of leadership roles with my highest rank retiring as a commander. I'm a leader in the LGBTQ community. I've organized, advocated for fair wages for employees and their benefits and mentored deputies in the value of policing as leaders themselves. My experience, I think, best qualifies me to be the sheriff San Diego County. It's clear that there has been a failure of leadership at the Sheriff's Department and our communities are paying the prices. I believe now more than ever, it's time to build a change, a change in leadership, a team that reflects our communities, our region and professionalism. Right now we see people taking into custody, they're dying in record numbers. It's costing taxpayers millions and millions of dollars. It doesn't have to be that way. I'm running for sheriff because I want to restore truth, faith, and transparency in the San Diego Sheriff's Department. I do not believe that in order to affect quality local law enforcement, that we have to work with immigration enforcement. I'm Dave Myers, and I'm running for sheriff. Thanks, John. Thank you, Dave. Um, and up next, then, we have Tommy Howe. Uh, Tommy, if you can hear us. Uh, you're on mute. I'll send you a message asking you to unmute. Yeah. I don't there know. we go. Are you uh, able to hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Wonderful. Thank you, John. I appreciate it. It's uh, Tommy Howe running for San Diego City Council in District 6 on the San Diego County Planning Commissioner. I think I know most of you, and I'm, I'm sorry that I missed uh, the bulk of the meeting. I've been out with my team today, and we've been out knocking on doors and uh, speaking with a lot of our neighbors and a lot of the voters in the community. And you've heard me speak before about the importance of really addressing the uh, considerable deficit in infrastructure attention and certainly infrastructure uh, spending that we've suffered from here in Mira Mesa and, and, and really in District 6. Part of the reason for that is because we simply haven't had a council member who hasn't been representing downtown special interests, downtown developers, and downtown lobbyists for years. That certainly applies to Chris Cates. It applies to Lori Zapp. And my God, it applies to Carl DeMaio, who used to represent this district as well. Our communities have never really had representation from our neighborhoods and instead, we have had, we've been saddled with a number of council members who basically have been representing downtown special interests through this council seat. And as a result, we haven't had a lot of the, uh, the pluses and advances that a more activist sort of uh, council member might have in some of our other communities around the city. That's a real problem. And my neighbors are starving for change. And it doesn't just relate to how we manage our roads. It relates to how we manage growth how we welcome new neighbors into our community, how we wind up getting effective transit that will encourage people to get out of their cars or ride their bicycles or simply walk more. We are at the economic crossroads of the city. We have Miramar here, we have uh, Sereno Valley, we even have the Convoy District all in District 6. And as we look at how we're gonna welcome new neighbors into Mira Mesa and Kearney Mesa especially, we need to find ways to really make a lot of these uh, suburban areas retrofit and a little bit more amenable uh, to more people walking around and being on bicycles. Furthermore, I would simply add that there was an interesting article that came out in Voice of San Diego this weekend that noted that one of my competitors is actually working with uh, a fundraiser who used to be the political director for the Chamber of Commerce and is a former uh, Republican. And this is of a concern because it's the same individuals who wound up funding Chris Kate the same individuals who wound up funding Kevin Faulkner. Our community doesn't need to have another council member who is simply looking out for downtown special interests and not the interests of District 6. That's why I'm running in the heart of San Diego and San Diego City Council District 6. My name is Tommy Howe, 
I hope to earn your support, and I hope this club and other clubs uh, will consider at least holding a forum since this remains the only open seat uh, in the San Diego City Council this cycle. My name is Tommy Howe, H-O-U-G-H. The website is TommyHowe.com. John, thank you as always for the opportunity to speak, and I hope everyone has a great evening. That's great. Thank you, Tommy. Um, yep, yeah, I'm with that. I think that's the last speaker we had raised. So I think that's everything for today's agenda. Um, and so with that, yeah, well, thank you all for coming. We've overrun by a few minutes here, but I think it was a great meeting. Um, Diane Mosley helped organize uh, most of it with Jerry um, and Andrew, and uh, we thank Ord as well. I think they've all had to drop off, and I know Diane had a plane to catch on her way home. Um, so thank you again, um, and we'll see you next month.